On behalf of the Alliance for a Healthier World, the MPH program, and the Centers for Global Health, I want to welcome everyone to Global Health Day. Um, we have quite a few uh, events planned for today, uh, and uh, it's really going to be our pleasure to uh, have our guest speaker address you in a little bit. But I have a few announcements and, and some background. So I'm Tom Quinn. I direct the Center for Global Health. And Global Health Day is a day in which we reflect on the challenges in health that we all face, and also a reflection of the accomplishments of our faculty and our students. This is really for the students um, that dedicate themselves uh, and are advancing themselves to addressing the challenges in health uh, worldwide. It's also kind of fitting that we reflect on what took place 40 years ago. The countries of the world met uh, in Amamata Atta and declared that health care is a right for all people. And I just wanted to give the first two declarations because they're so pertinent to the speaker that we had yesterday which was uh, Dr. Bessler, uh, the president and CEO of the Robert Woods Johnson program, who talked about their programs and improving access to health. And Dr. Punjabi, who will be talking about his dedication, his NGO, uh, and the work that they do. Take a look at this. It is 40 years ago. How far have we gone? Uh, and I, I'll just quickly read it with you because I think every part of this declaration is so critical to what we in public health and global health do today. So the conference, which again was nearly all the countries of the world, strongly reaffirms that health, which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity is a fundamental human right and that the attainment is the, of the highest possible level of health is the most important worldwide social goal whose realization requires the action of many other social and economic sectors in addition to the health sector. I'll just mention the second part of that declaration. There's many other parts, but I, I really like this one. The existing gross inequality in the health status of the people, particularly between developed and developing countries, as well as within countries, is politically, socially, and economically unacceptable, and is therefore of common concern to all countries. That was the declaration that all the countries signed 40 years ago. And we've made some strides, but I think it's really within our roots, what we call public health and global health, that we try to address these, these challenges. Uh, and we'll hear a lot about that today. So these are our principles, and we celebrate the students and faculty today who really work to honor this right to good health for all and recognize the global uh, within Baltimore, within Maryland, within the United States, and within the world at large. Pertinent to our education and service mission, I also like to announce that on April 16th, the schools of public health, nursing, and medicine will gather and will host the 50th anniversary of the Fogarty International Center with the director visiting us for the day, uh, Roger Glass. Uh, and uh, many of you who have benefited from the Fogarty know that it's dedicated to one thing, and that's the training of the next generation of scientists, public health officials to address the global health needs. So now just a, a minute, uh, if I may indulge, uh, about the Center for Global Health. Uh, since its founding in 2006, we have supported now 715 student travel, uh, travel grants, 70 faculty grants, and 12 new interdisciplinary international training sites. Last year, 45 students received global established field placements, 
or Global Health Field Research Awards. 16 were hosted by our newly established uh, uh, GEMS, which stands for Global Established Multidisciplinary Sites in three countries, and 24 residents and fellows receive funding to co uh, complete overseas elective rotations. This is our goal and our accomplishment is to help facilitate uh, the global health activities of both the faculty and the students um, to going into the field and taking what you learn in the classroom and, and practicing it out uh, in the field. To that effect, right after this session, right next door in the Feinstone Hall, we will have the students present 92 posters for their travels abroad for the last year. 92. Um, and if you go over there and see what they've done, uh, it's really fantastic uh, and uh, really always uh, amazes me of the, the, the passion and the commitment that the students have and the, and the role that the mentors have played. Now, on to the mentors. Uh, and the mentors really uh, need to be recognized. And we have four this year who have been voted by the student body uh, to be recognized as uh, the outstanding uh, mentors who guided them in their activities over, overseas. So uh, as I uh, will let the students speak for them, the awardees, uh, but when uh, each awardee hears their name, uh, would you please come on up to the podium uh, to receive a small token of our appreciation. And I'm gonna ask Dean McKenzie to come up to, to give you that award. So let me go to the, the, the first one, and that's Batki Hansadi. Batki, could you please come forward? <laughs> this is a quote from one of the students uh, who um, nominated Batki uh, to be an awardee. While six months pregnant, and her baby is here, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But Baki at the time was six months pregnant. She made her first trip to rural Umtada uh, in uh, the Eastern Cape of South Africa with the team, ran all the training, helped set up the study. It was truly inspiring. She teaches us every day to take ownership and to think critically about public health issues. More than anything, I admire her hard work and desire to grow while ensuring each of us grows in our own way. Bhatki, congratulations. All right, second awardee is Susan Harvey. Susan, are you here? Ah, there's Susan. So, Susan Harvey is also being recognized as an outstanding mentor. Here is the quote uh, from uh, one of the students. Her ability to inspire, motivate, and embody uh, students is one of the reasons she is a phenomenal mentor. Her ability to gently push students outside of their comfort zone is yet another characteristic that makes her an outstanding mentor because it has led uh, it has led uh, to me learning more than I could have imagined and feeling great pride in, in my work. So, Susan, congratulations to you as well. Uh, Connie Ho. Here comes Connie. This is uh, one of the quotes uh, for Connie. She hasn't seen these yet, so this is a, a first. I am grateful for the way she treats me as a colleague and appreciates my professional experience and skills while fostering my capacity to learn and grow. She's a great listener and teacher, and I'm blessed to have the privilege to work with her. Connie, congratulations to you. Okay, our final one, Caitlin Kennedy. I'm scanning. Caitlin is actually in a P 
PhD thesis defense uh, as we speak. She was going to hope to be down here. So we'll have to postpone, but uh, I will nevertheless because uh, I work with Caitlin as well, and, and she this is a great quote for her. She epitomizes the responsibility of capacity development and global health. She constantly commits to ensuring local ownership of research decisions um, uh, and making and places equal value and contributions uh, from project collaboration. She embodies exceptional leadership and mentorship qualities. I felt that my ideas, approaches, values, and contributions were perpetually celebrated and prioritized. So to Caitlin, I'm sorry you're not here, congratulations. <laughs> So Dean McKenzie is going to introduce our guest speaker, but just one final, uh, two final announcements, uh, and then I'll sit down. We have the winners of the poster awards, um, and uh, you don't need to stand up for any of this. We're going to congratulate you in the poster session. But third place went to Eric Wan and Sandra Taliro for their work on <laughs> trachoma in, in Colombia. Congratulations. Second prize went to Susie Pollard in Peru, evaluating a program to promote access to liquefied gas. And the first prize of the posters goes to Emily Nogorny and Marisol, I, I'm not going to pronounce this well, in, Car in a Karshian, uh, who worked on a COPD treatment and management program in Peru and in Uganda. Um, so congratulations to them all. Please come and uh, take a look at their posters and all the others, which got uh, many of them honorable mention. So it's, there's 92 posters out there, so uh, lots to look at. And there was also a, a global health photography contest First prize, and these photos are printed and are, uh, can be visualized in um, Feinstone. Uh, first prize goes to Tim Werwe. Uh, <laughs> title of the photograph is next in line. So it's, uh, it's, uh, you'll see, it's, it's quite interesting. Second is Vanessa Burroughs. For Los Niños de Los Manos. And third is, is Swati Sudison for Lardy's Prize. Uh, let's give a round of applause for everyone. Thank you. And Dean McKenzie, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's great to hear about all these prizes. It's a fantastic. Congratulations to all the winners. And I look forward to seeing at least some of the 92 posters. It's, that's uh, pretty remarkable. Um, but I, I have been given the great um, honor and privilege to introduce our Global Health Day uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Raj Punjabi. Dr. Punjabi is co-founder and CEO of Last Mile Health an associate physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Punjabi graduated from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and trained in primary care and internal medicine at Harvard, as well as at the Mass General Hospital. But most importantly, um, <laughs> he is a proud alum of our school, having received his Master's of Public Health. Yes, we can applaud. <laughs> having received his Master's of Public Health in Epidemiology in 2006. Going back a few years, um, at the age of nine, Dr. Punjabi escaped civil war in his home country of Liberia. He returned in 2005 to serve as a clinician in rural government health facilities. And in 2007, he uh, co-founded um, co uh, the Last Mile uh, Health. Under his leadership, Last Mile Health saves lives in the world's most remote communities, by partnering with governments in the design, scale, and advocate for national networks of community health professionals. And we'll hear a lot about the uh, program very shortly. Among his many accolades, Dr. Punjabi has received the Skoll Award for uh, Social Entrepreneurship, 
the TED Prize, and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, as well as Fortune's um, World's uh, fifth, uh, 50 Greatest Leaders. We are delighted and honored to have Dr. Raj Punjabi here with us today to help celebrate uh, Global Health Day. And please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Punjabi. Well, it's such a treat to be back here, and I am very proud of having had a chance to um, let's just get this going. I think I pressed the right button. Terrific. Well, something's definitely changed as all the touch technology and digital technology in the last 10 years. But what hasn't changed is just this spirit of, um, I think I learned it here, was that we're all teachers and learners. And it's just huge congrats to the mentors and the students that were there. Um, hi, Lisa. Uh, it's good to see you here. Um, I just was reconnecting with a few of you before this. And I, I actually will talk quite a bit about how, um, about how this place shaped me. I, I, you know, I came like many of the students here, understanding that this place would likely strengthen my skills. Uh, I was telling Dean McKinsey earlier that I, I didn't know how much you all would shape my dreams and inspire me to do the work I'm doing today. And I wanted to share, because I know many of the students are on journeys, uh, as, as many of us are, as certainly as I was, uh, was it 12 years ago when I, when I had just graduated. I thought I'd share today a bit about uh, my own journey and how this school shaped it along the way with the hope that it just offers some insight. It, it actually starts with, as many of our journeys do, with our parents and how they influence us. My father shared a lesson with me that I'll share with you. No condition is permanent. And no condition is permanent is something he would say to me again and again and again. He actually started thinking about it the day he lost his job in a, uh, when he was in his 20s in Liberia. Um, and it's something that stuck with him. And I learned it to be true actually the hard way. This is my family uh, 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 was in Liberia. Um, this is me. As you can tell, I was the most athletic kid in the class. Um, <laughs> I, 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 this is me in the fourth grade. I was nine years old. And my parents had migrated from India to West Africa in the 70s. I had the privilege of growing up in, in Liberia, and I was a, you know, pretty much a math geek, as a Marie Diener West can probably attest to. When I was here, I was pretty into biostatistics. And um, I loved kicking around with soccer balls, having the kind of life that really any child would dream of, uh, until things change. No condition is permanent. In 1990, civil war erupted in Liberia, in the countryside. And it started with rebels coming across the border from Ivory Coast. And they rallied so many people that by the time, in a matter of months, they had surrounded my hometown of Monrovia. One morning, my mom came knocking the night before the rebels had captured the international airport, uh, the only one we had. And she came knocking at my door and said, Raj, pack your things, we have to go. We were rushed into the center of town, and there on an airfield, we were put into two lines. I stood with my mother and sister in one of those lines, and we were stuffed into the cargo compartment of a relief plane. And as I stood there, sat there on this bench, looked out the cargo hatch, I saw hundreds of other people, Liberians with children strapped to their backs in many cases. And as they tried to jump in with us, I watched soldiers restrain them. They were not allowed to flee. We were amongst the lucky ones. We got resettled in America, in uh, High Point, North Carolina, which is where all Liberians uh, uh, and people fleeing war end up. <laughs> you may have um, uh, know the place from the furniture, but my parents uh, had been very fortunate to befriend some people who took our family in. And my dad started a clothing shop in Winston-Salem. We were selling jeans and sneakers. I would join him on weekends. And you know, every time business was bad, my dad would repeat that mantra again, no condition is permanent. And as immigrants, we started to believe that. We were benefited from the community around us who mentored me, who had put me through school. I had a chance to go to medical school eventually. And these dreams that had nearly been crushed by a war to become a doctor had been 
renewed. I had a chance to go to medical school, and when I was in my third year, I had finished up and I wanted, I had been fortunate enough to receive one of the inaugural SOMER scholarships. Thank you, Al. I don't know if he's here, but, um, uh, and, and to Mayor Bloomberg, I had a chance to come here and start that program uh, with other colleagues and start in epidemiology classes. Um, when I got here, I, uh, had still that memory in my mind. It was, I was 24 years old, I was nine when I left, I was 24 when I got here, and it had been 15 years since I had escaped that airfield, but the memory of those two lines had not escaped my mind. I wanted to go back to contribute, and it was here amongst you, uh, whether it was professors like David Celentano or Peter Winch or Marie Diener West and Bob Lawrence who taught me about human rights, um, or Marie Diener West who taught me about biostatistics, I had a chance to learn the skills but also to nurture the passion and the ethos um, and to have people say simple statements like I believe in you uh, that allowed me to go back home. I went home on a, how many students here have been on a winter session recently and done something um, with that? Yeah. Some of you have. Um, that was what I had had a chance to do. I had uh, received some support from the school to go to Liberia uh, to do some research on tuberculosis. And when I got home, I was pretty shocked. What I found was just utter destruction. The war had lasted 15 years and had claimed a quarter million of our people. We had just 51 doctors left to serve a country of four million people. It'd be like San Francisco having about eight or 10 doctors. So if you got sick in the city where you, you might stand a chance because you could get care from the few doctors that remained, but if you got sick in the remote rural communities where I had been asked to serve as a volunteer with the Ministry of Health, I was seeing my patients die from conditions no one should die from in the 21st century. HIV that could have been treated earlier, pneumonia that mom didn't, wasn't able to get her baby to the clinic uh, because they were days away. Imagine for a moment if you had a two-year-old in the rainforest in Liberia, if your daughter woke up sick with a fever, you'd panic because you realized that she could have malaria. And the only way to get her the treatment she needs would be to put her in a canoe, get to the other side, and then walk for up to two days just to get a diagnosis in the clinic. You know, thanks to the way you taught me how to think through epidemiology and biostatistics, I wasn't necessarily the best student, but I really cared. Um, <laughs> I, I, we were able to start interpreting this problem, not just by the painstaking and painful stories we heard from patients or the family members of patients, but from the data. We were seeing that in the DHS, that although the divide between urban health indicators and rural indicators were bad enough, in this case vaccinations were off by 10% in rural areas, if you disaggregated the data from within rural, which the DHS in Liberia doesn't do, um, and you looked at communities five or more kilometers, about an hour's or more from the nearest clinic, the data dropped off even further. We saw it in immunizations, we saw it in child health, we saw it in maternal health. I'm hoping David doesn't ask me a question afterwards about these data. Um, <laughs> but we were also seeing that there was a problem of inequality. The places that had the least progress in global health, the worst access, the least capacity, and the worst quality were also the places where spending was the least. In Konobo District, the red and yellow here are remote areas. The density is about seven people per square mile or less. We were finding that healthcare spending was uh, terrible. There's a colleague of ours, Sanjay Basu at Stanford, who's written about the infrastructure inequality trap, that places of high density tend to use resources at the healthcare center or the hospital every year when they apply to the Ministry of Health for a new budget, they've exhausted their budgets. Whereas places of remote low density never actually use the healthcare services because they're too far away or fewer do, they apply for less budget every year and they get less money even though there's more need and not any less demand. What we were finding is that in modern medical care, in global health, in modern global health, we've made some great progress since 1990 especially in the last few years, since Alma-Ada as Tom was talking about, a lot of great progress. We've seen child mortality cut by over 50% since 1990 across the world. We've seen an increase in access to treatment for patients with HIV, or more, more than 11 million people get access to treatment around the world from just a few programs like PEPFAR. 
but we haven't seen these innovations, technologies reach the last mile. There are about 3.7 billion people who lack access to quality health services. A billion people, we believe, the census data is not strong enough, but we believe, look at the 15% of the planet that doesn't have access to telecom, 15% lives in remote rural areas that don't have likely any access to healthcare. And this got me fired up. It literally lit a fire in my soul. I wanted to try to do something about it. No condition is permanent. And in this too, I learned that I wasn't alone, that there were um, leaders like Dr. George Comstock, who's, um, for those who are, may not know or have ever worked with Dr. Comstock, his picture's up in the, in the hall there. Uh, Dr. Comstock had worked on a very exciting project um, in the 50s in the, uh, rural Alaska, where they were finding that the incidence of the disease was higher than, at that point, any other place they had known of. Uh, they were able to cut the incidence of tuberculosis using isoneosid therapy and tested that in a, in a trial over the course of a decade or so, dramatically. I was in Alaska 50 years after that uh, as a college student um, when I was 20 years old and had worked with some of the heroes of that program. Back then they were called chemotherapy aides because they teamed up with public health nurses. They were people from the villages who were recruited by Dr. Comstock and the US Public Health Service to go door to door to deliver this medicine to help patients take it at that point for 12 months. And when I met them in, uh, as a college student in 2001, they were doing all kinds of things. In this remote area that was 20% the land mass of the United States, where about 150,000 people were living across the tundra, they had managed to get health care for everyone everywhere by employing these workers, by giving them career pathways that are now called community health aides. And we were teaching them how to do video autoscopy to look in kids' ears for recurrent otitis media. They were doing EKGs for patients, with adults who were presenting with chest pain. And they were being supervised remotely by doctors and nurses. They had really advanced the level of care and it was very inspiring to me back then, but meeting Dr. Comstock reminded me that the problems I was seeing in Liberia um, may have some relevance to the ones I had seen before. And of course that spring I returned from Liberia and took a course with um, the legendary professor Carl Taylor who in his class on case studies in primary health care introduced me to the work of Abe and Rani Bang. Not only did I have a chance after the summer program to go and look at their uh, wonderful program uh, training and equipping home-based neonatal, neonatal care providers who cut child mortality dramatically, not only did I do that, but uh, I was so inspired by their work that we named our firstborn son after Abe Bang, and so we now have um, a little boy named Abe. Um, that's how much you shaped my dreams and how much I think this place has continued to do that for over 100 years for many others. So I went back to Liberia after graduating uh, with my epidemiology MPH, and I realized that the answers didn't necessarily come only from the outside, they also came in partnership with communities from within. That's what I had learned from Dr. Comstock's work and Dr. Taylor's work, uh, at, and from many of you who have worked with them or in other ways similarly. So meet Musu for a moment for those who may not have worked with community health workers. She's uh, 48 years old when I met her. Uh, m about only a quarter of Liberian girls have a chance to finish uh, in rural areas, even past primary school. Musu had, with the help of her family, had been persistent and had a chance to finish high school. At the age of 18, she came back. And like many of us would, when you see people dying from conditions in your community no one should die from, felt horrified. She signed up as a volunteer community uh, leader and uh, was trying very hard to solve this issue. And when we, um, that, around that year, 2007, my wife and I were about to get married. Uh, we got engaged here in Baltimore and uh, with many Hopkins classmates around. So we invited a lot of them to our wedding the next year. And we didn't know how to respond to the issues that Musu and others were seeing. We did know that you could start a nonprofit to support the 12, 15 community health workers we had at the time who were supporting HIV patients. But because we didn't know how to raise money, we asked if uh, those coming to our class uh, and to our, to our wedding would forego the wedding registry and instead give us donations for a nonprofit we could start. We were banking on the fact that everybody in public health has these massive wallets uh, coming out of... Uh, <laughs> 
we were we were lucky. A lot of uh, some of you even uh, donated. We raised about six thousand dollars, and we started a nonprofit that was in, uh, now called Last Mile Health. And our goal was very simple: to bring a health worker within reach of everyone everywhere. So we started by working with people like Musu, uh, investing in her. That was one of the lessons that came from the work that the Alaskans had done with Dr. Comstock, that many had done uh, throughout Asia, including um, Henry Perry with Carl Taylor. Uh, that if you invest in these, in these community members, if you not, don't only make them participants in healthcare, but leaders in healthcare, if you offer them the training, if you offer them the equipment, the modern technology we now have, if you pay them for work that they deserve to get paid for so that they can have a sustainable income, you can see marvelous things. And many of you who've worked with community health workers have seen these images before, right? They can now uh, screen kids for malnutrition, assess the cause of a child's cough on a smartphone track kids for vaccinations. And with the help of nurses who coach them, like Diana, who I was just with yesterday, I just got back, uh, a couple days ago, I just got back yesterday, who go out each month to supervise and coach these workers, uh, you can see remarkable changes in the healthcare system everywhere, even where community health workers themselves don't have a direct service component, following follow-up support for patients with HIV and those who've lost their limbs. You know, what I got really inspired about was that these workers could help bring primary health care to places it otherwise would never reach. I, one of my favorite things to do as a physician is to spend time caring for these patients along with community health workers, and I'll tell you a story about uh, one of my favorite um, team members, AB. AB was in the eighth grade in a rural village, in a fishing village in, in Riversess County in southeastern Liberia when his parents passed away. He was orphaned at that in the eighth grade and he had to drop out of school. Well, a couple of years ago, Last Mile Health and the Ministry of Health recruited and hired and trained AB after his community selected him as a community health worker. And one day while making door-to-door -door house calls, he came across this little boy named Prince, who at the age of six months weighed what a one-month-old should. Well, Prince had been trained to use uh, upper arm circumference measuring tape to diagnose that this child was in need of hospital level care. He got the baby in a canoe with his mother, paddled upstream for four hours to reach the nearest clinic. And after the baby was discharged, mom was given instructions to give the baby some ready to use therapeutic food, the peanut butter type paste. And AB stood with mom day in and day out to make sure that she was supplementarily feeding the child and ensuring that she got the, that Prince got the food he needed. A few months after that, I had a chance to visit him, and this little guy was, it was a pretty chubby guy who was um, starting to mouth a few words and, and even start to stand at the age of one. You know, this is what inspires me about this work, why I do what I do, is because of workers like AB, team members, community members who join doctors and nurses to give care to their own neighbors. When I asked AB why he does what he does, he said to me, Doc, it's been almost 20 years since I dropped out of school, and this is the first time I'm having a chance to use a pen to write. My brain, as we say in Liberia, is getting fresh. That didn't sound that different than me here uh, 12 years earlier, and that's been a big inspiration, again, coming back to what this place teaches you. Pathos, ethos, logos. You come knowing about the right thing to do, and you get acculturated in ideas that healthcare is a human right. You come with your passion about the cause you're focused on. And this place teaches you the logic, how to think, so that you can actually make change. And so we were applying with some Hopkins graduates. Some of you may remember Mark Seidner or John Kramer, who were part of my class. Uh, many more have come still. We started to work with the Liberian government, asking them what was their policy objective knowing that the volunteer model uh, of community health was failing them at the point. There were about 3,700 workers on paper, but about 90% of them would drop out after 12 or 24 months of being on the job. They weren't delivering the care that was needed, and certainly there was need, and they wanted to. The government said, there are three questions. We would like to learn how to better supervise these workers with a clinician rather than just a peer, but both. We'd like to understand if we did pay them, 
um, about $70 a month, what might that do to their performance? And also what a more comprehensive continuum of care might look like with better training between the clinic and the communities. Well, we did a project with them in Conobo where the average age of death when we started was 26 years. It was driven largely by child and, and newborn mortality. That's equivalent to medieval Europe during the plague. And we were able to, over a few years, demonstrate some dramatic increases in utilization of healthcare services from qualified providers amongst the most, uh, uh, um, amongst the most challenging uh, healthcare conditions that lead to the greatest loss of life. We were seeing an increase in facility-based delivery. And we were just getting to work with the ministry and a number of other community health partners to see if we could revise the policy and try to help them build a stronger program that could truly leave no one behind. Well, that year, something catastrophic happened in the middle of the rainforest across the border from us in Guinea. There, a two-year-old boy named Emil would fall sick with vomiting, fever, and diarrhea. He would die, and a few weeks later, his sister would die, and a few weeks later, his mother would die. And this disease would spread from one village to another until three months later when it was turned out to be Ebola. When every minute counted, we had already lost months. As you all know, Tolbert Nyanswa, who was an alum of this program, was very much on the front lines. This disease had spread like wildfire across our region, taking the lives of our health workers, many of our community members. Airlines started closing off their routes. And I remember standing in the middle of the rainforest with a group of health workers who were trying to respond. We were helping them use and learn to use the masks, the gloves, the gowns they needed to keep themselves safe while they responded to patients they were seeing. I remember the fear in their eyes. And I remember as the CEO of this nonprofit, Last Mile Health, asking myself if I'd made the right call to keep them in the field. When Ebola threatened to bring humanity to its knees, Liberia's community health workers didn't surrender to fear. They did what they had always done. They answered the call to serve their neighbors. Community members across the country, some 10,000, learned the signs and symptoms of Ebola, teamed up with doctors and nurses to go door to door to find the sick and to get them into care. They literally formed an army of people, health workers that could go do and help hunt down this virus and stop it in its tracks. You know, we've learned a lot from the Ebola epidemic, many of which will be written from, for years and decades to come. One of the things we've learned is that we as human beings are not defined by the conditions we face, no matter how hopeless they seem. We're defined by how we respond to them. We also know that blind spots in rural health care can lead to hot spots of disease, and that places all of us at greater risk. And we know that and the best emergency system is actually an everyday healthcare system that leaves no one behind and reaches all communities, including those like Emil's. Well, the government of Liberia realized that in an in, in even deeper way after the Ebola epidemic. Um, some like Henry and uh, others and Tolbert uh, and many across the West African region were writing about the role of community health worker programs after the epidemic. And President Sirleaf, um, the first female president in Africa, said this about community health workers, that they were the most critical, uh, that they were serving the most vulnerable, and that they deserve to get support as well. So they launched a visionary program two days before the Ebola epidemic ended, uh, or first came under control in May of 2015 in Liberia. And they launched the National Community Health Assistant Program. This was a program that was to take a fragmented group of programs that were existing across the country and come under one unified high goal of a high quality program that's led by government. The goal was to better recruit, train, equip, manage, and pay these workers in several ways. And a number of partners, uh, all led under the government, rallied behind the government to help it with the policy work, uh, to reform its old policy, to understand the costing, uh, of what it would cost to do this, to understand where the funding would come from, to share curricula that had been developed. IRC had worked in the north on family planning. Partners in Health was working in the south on HIV and tuberculosis. We had done some work in Conobo. 
Plan International was doing other work, and of course our colleagues from across the funder agencies came together. So in 2016, in July, the National Community Health Assistance Program went from policy to program, launched uh, in rural Liberia, and over the last eight, about 18 months, uh, there's been a dramatic scale up uh, in the country. Almost a million people, there are about 1.2 million people who have no access to care because they live too far from the nearest clinic in these remote communities. Nearly a million of them uh, are being served. We don't actually know fully because the census is that challenging in these remote areas. We think the number is somewhere between 700,000 and a million. And they, we've seen some real data start coming back. About 3,300 workers have been trained. 40% are reporting. We're still trying to get the reporting rates up. 100,000 kids have been treated or screened for malnutrition. And they're going door to door actively to deliver health care. We're also starting to see some results coming back from. Uh, I had to put a status slide in here for you, Marie. Marie that was a <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the Ministry of Health and Last Mile Health have started to document some of the increases in utilization of care and mortality studies and cost effectiveness studies are ongoing. Um, we're seeing some impacts in key areas. I have to say the most important impact though is not told by the numbers but by the leadership and the ownership in the communities themselves. There's a community called Bo uh, where that had gone 100 years without any health care. A number of people, uh, the year the school was formed is when they formed their uh, community. They had gone into the forest looking for uh, their hunters um, and they, about 2,000 people had accumulated there across nine villages in the 100 years that were there. They'd never actually ever had any health care until a few years ago when they had this program in place and the community then formed an outreach clinic with the Ministry of Health and we together then worked, a 24-year-old young man who had never finished high school decided to take the concession money they were getting from the logging company there, about $5,000, and start the walls of a clinic. Today, when I went there as a medical student uh, and a public health graduate in 2007, community members told me of the stories of mothers who were stuck in obstructed labor, who had to be hoisted on a hammock with branches. And sent through the forest by foot to reach the nearest hospital. Of course, those mothers never made it. They perished. That panic has been resolved. There's now mothers about, the clinic opened in September. Uh, it was the first community health center coming out of this. And uh, um, uh, already in the first month, there were about six deliveries at that clinic with a midwife. Uh, and some of the community health workers have now started to participate in the clinic work as well. That really brings me to the last lesson which is about being in this together. I think that's one thing this place taught me and you could see that, that if you can partner with government, if you can do this for the long term, if you can partner with communities, if you can do that for the long term, really true amazing change can happen. Certainly in our country, we had not seen that kind of change before. I wanna now talk about how that actually links to the global work that many of you here are involved in. Um, we know that there are about 73 countries where uh, thanks to Henry's and others work where 8.9 million preventable maternal newborn and child deaths are happening. A lot of that's happening in rural areas. Um, I'll encourage all of you, I, I left my book over there, Henry, but I encourage you to read his new book uh, about the, how, what could happen if we scaled up the coverage of evidence-based interventions, many of which, by the way, were originally researched here, I believe. Um, 30 services, if they were scaled up to 90% coverage in these countries, we could save millions of lives. Actually, it turns out about 2.5 million lives uh, could be saved each year. We also know that we could help these countries create millions of jobs. Colleagues from uh, uh, the Financing Alliance for Health, some ministries of health, as well as Henry and others, uh, we all worked together a few years ago from the, with the UN uh, and UNICEF and others to, to make a case for investing more in these workers. And it turns out the, the case pulls you down to 10 to 1. I don't know how. I'm an epidemiologist, not a financial modeler, but um, it's pretty, the intuition's pretty clear, right? If you invest in these workers, you save lives, more healthier, productive life years. If you invest in these workers, you might help mitigate the impact of Ebola. Ebola cost billions of dollars to us. If it had been stopped at its source, we might have spent a lot less money and saved a lot more lives. And lastly, it creates jobs by actually employing workers like AB and Musu. So we have last year been so inspired by this work that we, we were honored to receive uh, and grateful to receive the TED Prize, which is to make a million dollar wish for the world. 
And the other thing I learned here was about ambition so and about uh, contribution, not attribution. So we created the are creating the Community Health Academy, which is uh, intended to be a global platform to train, connect, and empower community health workers and the leaders who support them. We're building on the work uh, using a digital platform as well as some in-person work. We're building on the work that's happening across the world. Uh, we know from seven countries we're working with now uh, in USAID and UNICEF to document lessons that there are many innovations. A group of uh, us nonprofits uh, from working in about 15 different countries came together, uh, this is all free and downloadable online at chwimpact.org, which is a guide on what might optimize these community health systems. So together with this group of colleagues from organizations around the world, including yours truly, Micah, who I, I Micah, you, there you are next to Henry in the back, um, are working together to try to create a longitudinal curriculum that could take the best practices in community health systems leadership, and have it taught not by a chap in Boston like myself, but actually taught by the ministries in those countries for each other, um, as well as helping community health workers. So at the, at the health systems level, we're starting to work with um, uh, the, the office of Bill Gates and others to try to identify exemplars in, in global health. Um, these are what are the, po what, what might help predict positive outliers in community health systems. So this will be some of the content uh, that will be generated on this platform. We're working with our nonprofit online course provider called edX. Um, and I, I would first, and the other thing we're doing is to actually train with uh, community health workers. To, there's so many uh, 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 reasons. Community health workers shouldn't just be trained with flip charts and markers. There's so many reasons that technology could help within a strong system support the acceleration of these community health workers learning those 30 skills that Henry's written about in a way that's accurate and clear. Uh, we're working with a group now to, uh, with a, a very exciting platform. Uh, some of you may have worked with them through Empowering Frontline Health Workers, which actually allows ministries of health anywhere to take their existing curricula and digitize it and sc uh, help score community health workers on their work, uh, allow them to take medical training, like many of us who uh, support our training with continuing medical education, download videos. Uh, we found in our sites that it was very hard for community health workers to diagnose uh, the difference between severe and non-severe pneumonia. About 20% of the time, they're getting the diagnosis wrong. Well, you and I know that's where the biggest mortality impact is coming from if you get that diagnosis right. And so we've started by actually putting some videos around recognizing respiratory distress because it turned out in their training, it's not part of the national training that they see a patient with respiratory distress. So putting that in the context of a smartphone and, uh, and a tablet uh, with a nurse can be helpful. I would invite any of you, because we're just in the middle of creating this, to join us in this effort. Um, if you uh, want to register for the courses, you, can, you certainly can can do that. Help us get the word out. The first one, uh, the enrollment will start this fall. It will go live next spring in January 2019. And then we hope to build a series of courses along supporting the work that many have done here in, in primary health care. Uh, and again, do that with others from around these countries. Our dream, our dream is that this academy could contribute, could contribute to the training of hundreds of thousands of workers. From the forest communities of West Africa where I worked, to the fishing villages of Alaska where Dr. Comstock worked, from the hilltops of Appalachia where Henry worked, to the mountains of Afghanistan where Carl Taylor last worked. And I think if we can do that, I think we could persuade and continue to persuade governments and countries that a healthcare revolution really is possible. So if you go to the, to the website, communityhealthacademy.org, you can sign up for updates. And if you've got ideas on how to make this better um, and, and want to join, contribute content curriculum, please, please reach out to us. Or, or if you want to use this for the workers you work with. I'll end with this. Um, it's 100 years since, congratulations, um, since the school was started. And I, I thought I'd end, um, again, thinking about my father's mantra, no condition is permanent, with this reflection. I, um, my wife and I, um, I, we just have a newborn baby at home who's uh, today six months old, and uh, she's our third. Um, I have two sons, and um, you know, we, I was recently caring for a woman uh, who, like my wife, had had uh, three pregnancies, but unlike my wife, had not had any prenatal care with her first two babies. And that's because she lived in an isolated part of the forest, Bo actually, 
that had previously had no health care before for 100 years. Until a few years ago when a nurse trained her neighbors to become community health workers. I was there caring for her with an ultrasound and I put the ultrasound on her belly. And we were she was telling us stories about her first two kids. And she looked up at me and she said, Doc, what's that sound? It was the first time she'd ever heard her baby's heartbeat. And her eyes lit up in the same way my wife's eyes and my own eyes lit up when we heard our baby's heartbeat. You know, for all of human history, illness has been universal and access to care has not. But I believe because of communities like this one, no condition is permanent. I think it's time, it's time for us to go as far as it takes to change this condition together. Thank you. Inspiring presentation, and of course, now I'm getting the call. <laughs> Is that bad timing or what? <laughs> um, anyone uh, wish to ask questions uh, uh, or commentary? We have microphones on either side. Um, I just think that it's a, a truly inspiring. Uh, presentation that you gave us. And I actually, before we came, uh, you and I just chatted a little bit. Uh, many of you will be graduating in a couple months. Uh, he shared with me what he did shortly after graduation when you were 24 years of age and you went back to Liberia. Do you just want to share a snapshot of that? Because it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, well, thank you, Tom. And I, um, I, when I went, I, I left here in 2006. I first went to go visit Abe and Ronnie Bond because I was just so fascinated by what I'd learned in Carl's class. And uh, I didn't know I was going to be naming my son after him because I didn't even hadn't even gotten married at that point. Um, I, I then went back to Liberia, um, and I, uh, e <laughs> for those of you who worry, I, I was asking earlier about yeah. the anxieties we feel in our careers, and I asked a room of co uh, students um, uh, whether you felt anxious about your careers. I think all the students, all the faculty raised their hands. <laughs> um, and sometimes it feels like these things when you tell them in a narrative as if it was all just neat and it just easily happened. And that happened because someone was born there and they, you know, it, 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 it didn't even happen that way for me. I got back and I was so uh, outraged by the lack of health care in the rural public sector. I uh, wanted to work for the Ministry of Health. I didn't know how. I didn't have any connections. So I emailed, I googled uh, the email addresses of the Minister of Health and others and I emailed them on a Sunday night asking if I could help and I had just come back. Uh, the next morning at 7 a.m., to my surprise, I got an email back from the Deputy Health Minister for Planning. And uh, he said, come to my office. You must be responding to our intellectual SOS. This was a term they came up with because we had lost so many professional people during the war. And I said, sure. Uh, <laughs> so I showed up. And uh, by 2 o'clock, I had a job, uh, uh, not paid, but uh, <laughs> that's how it usually goes in public health, as you know. Um, and I was workshopping, uh, helping workshop the National Health Plan. Uh, pr um, Preeman asked me earlier whether I want to remain a, uh, remain a clinician or found public health practice more useful or policy work. And that week was pretty defining for me. The next day, we were in a room, 15 people, no electricity in our capital, uh, looking at the five-page uh, national health policy. That was the total health policy in 2006. The last census was in 1986. There was no laptops in the Ministry of Health. Um, and they were trying to figure out how to make a new national health plan. Well, one statistic had come back, which is about 50 doctors, what I mentioned earlier. And I thought to myself, boy, I'm a clinician. Um, I need to be involved in that. And I asked if, as, as, as great as it would have been for CV padding to say I helped with the national health plan, um, I tried to resist that urge because I'd learned that from you guys, that, that quality, rigorous uh, attention to being close to the people you serve matters. So the ministry sent me down to rural Liberia a few weeks later, we saw HIV patients. We saw testing happening, but treatment wasn't happening. Um, 
because the ministry had a policy that said only doctors could prescribe ARVs. I mean, I know that sounds ancient now, um, but then it, Liberia hadn't yet caught on to the work that had been, do been done in South Africa and elsewhere to train non-physician clinicians. So because of that proximity, but also because of the work you all had taught me about public health, we were able to get testimony from our patients and share that with those ministers, who then converted their policy, or at least gave us a chance to. Uh, and we used uh, uh, data, um, of course, again. John Kramer, also a proud uh, alum of Mary's class, uh, um, wrote up some studies that uh, showed that there was a better rate of survival if you attached, um, if you did this in rural areas, non-physician clinicians and community health workers. So to me, that, that um, you know, uh, Googling, I guess the story is, if you Google someone's email, it may actually lead somewhere. It's not, cold leads also work. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. It also, you know, brings about uh, sometimes opportunity presents itself in very different ways. Yeah. And it's the ability to seize that opportunity and to shape uh, which way. He's so eloquent, you, isn't he? No, no. I love this guy. No, which way your life's going to go because yeah. I, I shared similar experiences that we, we talked about. Yes. Questions? Yes. Um, hi, um, my name is YG. I'm from the MPH class. Um, some of some people say that you know making a real global health impact and being a leader like a CEO or like yourself are two different ball games. They require different skill sets, different kinds of you know attributes, etc. But you've obviously done both brilliantly well. And my question would be, what are some of the most important lessons that you've learned in your journey to becoming a leader, especially in terms of vision casting, team building? and leaving a legacy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, I don't know if I've you know, really gotten good at any of those skills. Uh, I, I really think I've been lucky that, and I think this is the lesson in leadership for me, is, the, um, is that leadership, you know, it's interesting, we define it, um, a leader, leadership, it's, it has this very individual sense of it. Uh, I found that you know, the team's leadership is, is 100x more important. Well, I haven't done an RCT around it, but yeah, I think it's 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 really really important. And so we were very lucky to have people who had those skills. I I didn't do any of these studies myself. I actually Mark and John, who I met in class here, who were much more skilled in epidemiology and biostatistics, um, did that work. Um, I had taken Peter Winch's class on medical anthropology, and so I didn't know how to do anthropology just out of one class, of course, but I was able to have that perspective, so those perspectives matter. We brought that onto our team. Um, so I think, I think that's been one lesson, is just collaboration uh, and collective leadership is, is so much more important. Learning how to build teams is probably something we could all um, learn and teach more. Um, the second, I think, is long-term engagement. I mean, it's easy, again, now, 10 years in, to tell a story that feels like a linear progression. But there are lots of, um, not just Ebola, you know, um, of ways this was very non-linear in that way. So we, I think we were failing five years in. We'd helped maybe 500 patients and um, really weren't getting very far. Uh, and I think it's because we had an unfocused mission and we had an unclear sense of who we're trying to serve. Um, and we just let all that go. We transitioned programs we were failing at. We picked the one program we were doing good at and doubled down on it. So I think we wouldn't have learned that if, um, if the goal was achievement. If it was growth and learning, then uh, we were able to let go and try to be a little more humble about and say, admit that we'd failed. So I think it's the other piece is long-term engagement. And I, you know, my friend Paul Farmer, who was here when I was a student, said to me, as I told some of the students here uh, in one of these dinners with him, um, had said, you know, long-term engagement is not measured in years, it's measured in decades. And, and Tom was talking about this. If you really look at your um, teammates here, your classmates, or your professors who've, who you really admire, almost all of them have done something for decades, whether it's in a place, or it's on a cause, or it's uh, trying to answer a question or a problem. And I think that's the other big piece of leadership that's mattered to me. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, right at the back. Way in the back. <laughs> Way in the back. Hi. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Warugoro. I'm an MPH student from Kenya. I have a difficult question, just to warn you in advance. Um, first, thank you for all the good work you're doing in Liberia. I think thank community you. health workers are a more sustainable form of global health and something that is from the community. But my question, I guess, on global health in general is, can we move from a more charity-based to a more sustainable model? Because the premise of this is there were people in Liberia and Sierra Leone working for decades, or at least a long time, maybe a decade, 
on different programs, but the moment something that wasn't in a HIV program came up, yeah. there was nothing to hold it. Yeah. So based on the current global health model, if you continue, if there's a viral outbreak in Gabon that will wipe out the world in five years, yeah. global health hasn't really catered for that if you continue the current charity model. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think um, it does need to change. And I, I, I think it changes in part if we know it's the right thing to do to prioritize domestic, I don't even know why it's called that, but local leadership. Uh, to prioritize a country's resources being used for the country's challenges, this country's people who are leading the work. We were founded by community health workers in 2007, um, and we've seen how, uh, how that helps the ethos and the culture of a place. It's just the right thing to do. And I think it will happen more if we argue that it's the strategic thing to do. Um, Liberia's National Community Health Assistant Program, uh, the one I showed, uh, was, was, you know, we all contributed to that effort, the different NGOs, but none of us, none of us, thanks to the Minister of Health who was leading at the time, who said, don't do business as usual, were her words to us. None of us are trying to take credit like it's our program. I mean, the world of social media bestows credit on the NGOs because we have communications arms, et cetera. But we've continued to try to bring it back to the leadership of the Ministry of Health. And methodologically, and that's a second strategic area, um, five years ago when we changed our mission and our strategy, we wrote a strategy statement, as, as Dean McKinsey read out, that says we are s there to support governments to build national networks, not last mile health, but governments. So um, you know, I think that's a small, subtle thing to say, but what it means is that we're not, NGOs need to stop taking credit and try to, uh, credit seeking can be a virus. It also can demolish uh, government ownership. I think it also means strategically that you're staffing yourself, like we did during the Ebola crisis with Tolbert Nyanswa, to go and take minutes for him and actually help him plan an agenda when he was trying to bring the Ebola actors together. Um, you know, I think I th he was the, the leader, one of the leaders in the Ebola crisis and alum from here. So I hope that's useful. I'm happy to talk offline with you, but I think it's a very important question. And I think generally, uh, again, strategically, you're going to get better results at scale and better impact if you do it in that way than if you try to do a charity model. Hi, Raj. Um, I'm Karen Thomas. I'm the Bloomberg School historian. And um, I'm just really excited to see that you're the latest in a long line of uh, Hopkins uh, alums and faculty who are promoting community health workers, going all the way back to John Black Grant, who yes. initiated that idea in China um, with the Barefoot Doctors Movement. Um, I. I was wondering, um, you know, it seems like such a terrific idea that has been put forth for literally a century, yet it is far from universal. And I was wondering, what do you think are the main obstacles to yeah. a much wider adoption of community health assistance? And I saw in almost every picture, you've got this technology, <laughs> yeah. is, you know, and how might technology end up kind of breaking the, impasse. Yes. Thank you for that, Karen. Um, I actually one of J.B. Grant's Barefoot Doctors is the grandfather of someone who worked on the costing analysis for this program. So I think, I think that's part of it, is that um, our colleague Nan Chen and the Financing Alliance and others have helped the Ministry of Health to figure out the cost. I think, I think we need to get a lot more rigorous about helping um, countries who are thinking about these programs make the case for why, not, not substituting for hospitals and clinics, but adding and helping extend the reach of their healthcare system and dollars could make a difference. Um, so so I, think, I think that's one big barrier. I don't think we've done enough there. Normatively, I think things need to change that we should always promote volunteerism. Uh, uh, no doubt, I mean, I started as a volunteer, right? If you would have said don't volunteer after you sent that email, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, and for those who are formally part of the healthcare system, uh, they should be given a chance to get a job out of this, I think. I think that's the other big one. And then I think is the technology piece. I mean, I, I don't, I think there's a big fascination with smartphones, and um, I, I certainly, we've actually launched projects around it. I think I'm more fascinated by them when they actually can drive real uh, public health problems to solutions. And I, 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 Alan was just there coaching our team about gaps in the system. Uh, uh, so in other words, if they help you get more transparent data, if they help you uh, uh, get better data about how good your community health workers are at diagnosing pneumonia, if they help you train, uh, but always helping. It's never drop a parachute with a smartphone down and they're going to just learn it themselves. Uh, self-driving, I'm just kidding. Um, 
Uh, Self-driving smartphones uh, is what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but but um, I think that I think that uh, that is a big help. But I would also argue there's so much technology that's already out there, from rapid diagnostic tests to uh, video autoscopy to tele EKGs. There's so much that's already sitting on the shelf that we haven't gotten into the hands of the workers. And I'm, I'm, I was moved in 10 years ago to see the home-based neonatal care program where they had trained using the technology of injectable needles and uh, antibiotics, which has been around for a long time, to teach these women in the communities to, to cut neonatal uh, 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 pneumonia and sepsis by 25% in terms of mortality rate from it. It's still not as far as we all want it to be. We, that should be in every country's plan. Liberia, though it has the highest newborn mortality rate in the world, did not adopt that in the modules and the protocol. So I think the other big barrier uh, is because the worry was, uh, you know, do they, do we know how to? The, the innovations are not spreading fast enough, uh, and I, and I hope again the academy and the work you're doing here uh, can can try to accelerate some of that, the spreading of innovation. So probably two more time for two more questions. First over here, uh, and then the follow up. Hi, I'm Asa, and I'm a master's student here from Burkina Faso. And thanks for sharing that impressive journey of yours. My question is, um, I'm sure it wasn't simple for you to go back to Liberia after several years and get to establish such a strong health um, community health program. So what are the obstacles or challenge that you encounter that you can um, reflect on and help others in the same initiative too? avoid that in the future. Yeah. And my second question is, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about the real impact being in the leadership and in the community. So my question is, when coming with this growing interest of number of public health, where, do you, where and how do you draw the line between the rates for number and publication and the community, community empowerment and satisfaction? <laughs> Good questions. Wow, those are really good ones. Uh, on, on the first one, um, I, I know this sounds like so at a principle level, and I'm happy to get uh, direct in touch with you about tactics. But I do think one thing that you face as a young person or as a young professional in this work is uh, you know public health and medicine are pretty hierarchical, right? I mean, just medicine is much more hierarchical than public health is, but it, it's still for the hierarchical. You, you get a lot of cynicism and skepticism about you. So I would say surround yourself with people who believe in you. A lot of people here, as you know, who would do that and stay in touch with you afterwards. Um, the, the, the second thing I would say is to do stuff others won't do. And that could be as simple as signing up at the ministry workshop to take minutes, uh, Ministry of Health workshop, or it could mean uh, uh, going to Konobo District, which you know, people called us bush doctors uh, when we were going there. Not, and people joke around about Liberia, but it's actually pretty pejorative uh, that it, uh, we were being uh, silly, like cowboys going out to the forest that we were going to try to make a difference. Um, and I just would, I would uh, don't surround yourself with those people and realize that if you just follow the data, um, I think Al Somer taught us this in one of our first sessions with him around vitamin A. People didn't believe and were skeptical. He followed the data. If you follow the data, um, I think you're more likely to, to succeed. Um, the, the, the second point about, I think you were asking um, about careers, like there's a big push to get published, and that's linked to career advancement. Um, and, and then there's community empowerment. I actually think the two things, like once we, how you frame a problem is really critical, right? I don't know if, the, I think the framing has to change. Uh, the place where anyone who's involved in rigorous research can, rigorous research can have the greatest impact is on, in the healthcare system, is on community health. I mean, Henry's in the back there, uh, read his new book. You know, what other intervention, what other way could we have learned that community health workers could save two and a half million year life, two and a half million lives a year? Right? I mean, if you do the math, and I, I can say this because I, uh, I'm not a, 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 you know, a full professor, but I think if you ask Henry, if you do the math over up to 2030, you could save 30 million lives by 2030, right? I mean, what else could you do that could save that many lives? It says millions of lives at a time. So I just think that's, to me, this is the most exciting place to get involved in, in public health is community health, largely because it's been ignored, except for you know, the types of folks who've come through here. And I think rigorous research is absolutely essential there. Thank you. I, I like your uh, comment. 
follow the data. Yeah. That, that resonates well here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if, if any of you, you know, we're trying to do a number of research studies, I think the other end you'll see is the community health organizations are hungry for that. But we can't staff our teams in the way we'd like to unless people from Hopkins and other places say we'd like to be involved. So I think you'll see a lot of willingness on the side of those groups. Last question. Uh, Raj, I had uh, some questions for you. So firstly, uh, you told us that you came, you went to library and then you came back and then and that's when you did a residency. You, so yeah. you went back after, straight after medical school and then you worked there and then that's when you came back here and yeah. you did medical school. I mean, I mean, you did a residency, right? Yes. Second thing is, uh, regarding sustainability, as they told, what happens in LMICs when you work? Uh, the basic uh, sort of notion which people have in public health is that it's not going to sustain themselves when you're working as a physician or a non-physician. That's a big like dilemma for people. I'm a self physician, so it's a different story, and I can work things out. But it's a, it's a, it's a sort of tougher path for people who want to work in public health, and they're non physicians. So how how do we uh, like propagate the fact that public health is also sustainable for every strata of people working in it? Uh, and thirdly, since you're talking of the Grant family, we have Laura Grant and Alex Grant here who've come just to uh, listen to your uh, keynote today. So I, would, I just want to make sure that you meet them afterwards. And lastly, uh, I'll be around. So I'm and, coming to the poster session. And uh, lastly, in the last eight months here, I've listened to a lot of keynote speakers. But I tell you, I've, no one has been as inspirational as you. And as your father told you, I take back the same mantra that no condition is permanent. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you. For that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think your point about being sustained when you're a, a non-physician clinician or non-clinician, period, uh, is so important. I think you know Dean McKinsey has written in this spring issue. I still r get and read my Hopkins uh, alum magazine, or just you know Hopkins, the the, the magazine that you send out. Thanks, Paul um, Wong. Um, the you know she wrote about this vision for public health 3.0. Um, you know, the very original public health is also about this idea of getting uh, social determinants. I mean, David's done this work on the HIV crisis for so long. It's been so groundbreaking. So I don't, I, it is visionary for this school that has held public health, created it from the very beginning to call for that and for the rest of us to follow the lead. Um, and we also should realize that like nothing happens in public health without the public, right? It, do, it doesn't happen without clinicians. It doesn't happen without community members. Uh, so it's been true all along. And I love that uh, your vision is to try to add rigor, greater connection to, to that, to make it part of the mainstream, because it's not part of the mainstream. I think that's a key part uh, of it, um, for sure, for sure. And I think, again, the community health workers w is, a, is a, just a, another symbol of that. Right? I mean, if the world switches to paying these workers rather than saying they shouldn't get paid, which is what we were, the Liberian government was told when they argued for paying them, mm. uh, they didn't say pay them because we want to pay them. They should get paid, anybody should, for doing important work. Uh, and it's important because it's tied to public health outcomes. Right? You get better results if you do it. I think that, that I hope, will happen with the social determinants and all the teams and teams of teams that need to be at play in public health. And thanks for your kind words about, about that. This actually comes, my dad learned it from a, um, from a uh, you know those bumper stickers on trucks? Uh, <laughs> there's a deeper story about it, but in West Africa there was an author who wrote a novel, I think, with this title. I think he's from Nigeria. Um, and so the truck drivers, uh, it just kind of got passed on. My dad was sitting in traffic after he lost his job for a really long, long, long time and was very de depressed. He looked up, he says, and he saw a truck with no conditions permanent. So. Uh, don't discount bumper stickers and don't <laughs> discount uh, fortune cookies. <laughs> Thank you very much.